we, we, we require ourselves to keep the fly at a certain depth, maybe five to 10 feet down, but we need a, a shooting line. And these are our 25 foot tungsten coated line. And we shoot them out, the back end is level. And basically there's the belly and we shoot these lines out and we strip them back. And I would love to say, I would like to catch these, you know, a lot of these fish on six and seven weights. But what I have found is the pace of the fly that needs to be stripped at and the depth, there's sometimes I have to use eight, nine, 10, even 11 weight rods and fish a heavier grain weight, which is this right here, the section of line to get the pace that the fish want to hit for the day to react to them. If you really want to get specific, but day in and day out, your floating line with sinking leaders will get the job done. But just to clarify, when you go to purchase a sinking line, this gray section here is weighed and it's in grain weights per foot. But basically 250 grains of grain will be a seven weight all the way up to 450 grains for an 11, 12 weight. So that's how we determine what we use on the end. But that's gonna be a specialty line. I think the one of the better ones that you might wanna get into is an intermediate. So on top of this, this is a very effective line for pond fishing, subsurface flies in and around your favorite farm pond. But this is an intermediate sinking line. The head is at the shooting line level into your belly into this mass up front which is an intermediate sink and that sinks around one to two inches per second um, at a slow rate and then you could add on you know a normal fly but generally we add on a weighted fly some type of weighted fly to get it down a little bit below the intermediate one nice thing about what um with an intermediate line is is that it also adds a little more traction to a popper or a surface fly or a diver it creates a little more disturbance, a little more pop, a little more wake to trigger some of these flies. So a lot of times my go-to line, if I'm only carrying one line for the day and I'm walking around the break walls would be an intermediate line. If I was looking to purchase a line other than a floating line would be the intermediate. And then there's the compounded lines, which are, I use a lot on the boat, but I think from a shoreline perspective, it's not real, you know, not really a, apply a whole lot, but if you had a kayak or a small boat or something, or a canoe, even a paddle board, the triple density lines where they're gonna be sinking at three inches per second, then it goes to basically five inches a second to seven inches. It gives you a really nice bell curve fish to it that gets you down, keeps you down um, with the smaller diameters in a very, very effective for me, in midsummer, late summer applications when I'm fishing as deep as, you know, 25, 30 feet, maybe in the fall time for lake trout and stuff over in Erie PA. So this is um, basically, I think I should get it to play, is a casting, is how to cast these sinking lines. As you can see, it's a real slow, methodical process. But what I mainly want to show is that it's more of a lob cast, letting the heavy weight line or your heavy weight floor go. But if you notice the strip, that's going to be the key to catching fish, is that the angler that can figure out the pace of the strip is going to be the angler who catches the most fish. If you're just stripping the fly at a rhythmic motion, strip, 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 you're gonna catch a few fish, but the action of the stop of the strip and the pause, it's just sometimes as much as one to three seconds or more that allows us to impair the action to the fly. So your pace of strip might be strip, 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 pause, one strip, but you have to find the magic key to be able to unlock the secret to catch the fish. There's many a days that you would think you have the strip figured out from the day before and the fish are going to tell you different by your different methodical strip or a faster strip. So you have to play around with your strips 
to be successful. A little, a little word of maybe the wise is if you're gonna chase a drum, they're gonna like a really long pause with shorter strips or a really slow methodical tarpon strip with pauses. Um, the catfish are gonna like a real, like a shorter pause with shorter little hops. It's interesting how each fish have their own distinct likeness to the strip. One thing other than your, maybe a cup, maybe a one or two extra fly lines, but even without purchasing a fly line, one of my recommendations would be to make yourself a homemade stripping basket. Um, because if you're navigating around the break wall rocks or off of your boat or something, managing the running line or managing the back end of your floating line without getting tangled in the rocks is very difficult. So I think, you know, for even if you get yourself an old dishwashing tub and a old waiting belt, make yourself a, make yourself a basket. This is the scientific angler one. It's really, really easy. It's super light. It comes on and off. Um, but I use it almost exclusively along the break walls and even, even from the smaller kayak just to keep things not tangled or drop it in the water. Uh, we don't use them a whole lot in the boat, but in and around the, the, our normal fishing situations or wade fishing, extremely effective. Let's talk a little bit about the bugs. So we divide them in two categories. When the fish are active, a bait fish pattern is very effective. Um, but I would like to say the fish are always on the hunt or the chase, but they are not. But standardly, if you try to imitate a crayfish, a goby, some type of helgramite, but basically they don't know what it is. They just know that it's a slower presentation. Um, that's the key to all of this is that Think of it, if the fish are active, your strip will be active, your strip's gonna be more active, faster with pauses. And then eventually this is where the sinking lines or a heavily weighted dumbbell lead weighted eye fly. And you're gonna to have to creepy crawler this along the bottom. And if you're fishing the break walls, you're gonna get a few snags. So be prepared to tie some fairly basic crayfish patterns like these. Um, don't have to get super elaborate, but that's gonna be your go-to. Play around with the colors that you see there from the olives and the oranges um, are some of my favorite colors, darker browns, um, even some whites just to give it little things, but the tans, the olives and the dark browns um, are gonna be your go-tos. Um, one little suggestion is make sure you try a fly that has some type of highlights of orange on it. Um, I would have to say, and people always say, you know, do eye color and highlights matter? And it's just like steelhead. You have to have targets, but these, I do firmly believe that with the, as a fly angler, that these highlighted points are very important. And I'll get into that next. This is just a, a changer type goby pattern that we strip along the bottom very methodically. It's got a 45 degree eye that doesn't snag up as much. And you could use that on a sinking leader um, along with your floating line. They're a little bit of a nuisance to cast, but they catch extremely really well. Um, I do prefer to fish my changers of these flies with a stinger hook, just because a lot of times the fish um, are a little picky. So if you're fishing on the bottom or near the bottom structure, um, fly rod fishing, the fish are inactive. Um, and one thing I did learn from gear fishing there are times that my retrieve is anywhere from two to five, maybe even seven minutes per retrieve when the fish are negative. So as a fly angler, we have to sort of use that same methodical approach of slow and go, and the fish won't be as aggressive to bite. So I do like a trailer hook. This is a standard array of bait fish patterns. That's just probably within maybe a half a day's of fishing to the flies that I went through to try to find the magic key. Um, some of the bullet points I will go over though, is that eye color and eye size when you're tying your flies or purchasing more weights is a key factor. So if you're, a, if you're targeting drum, you're gonna to want to fish the largest dumbbell eyes you could possibly cast comfortably 
because the drum, the freshwater drum, like a retrieve that is very vertical, up and down, up and down, up and down. They like it on the drop. And so do catfish. There are times they might like the lazy swimming motion, but generally a heavily weighted fly that jigs up and down will catch you the most channel catfish and drum. Now, on the other hand, a smallmouth bass prefers an unweighted fly or even a floating fly with a sink tip on it because they like what's called a neutral buoyancy fly. They like a change of direction. They like a, a fly that hovers in their face, basically like a, like a conventional fisherman, what's called a jerk bait. So these game changers and these hollow flies that we tie or the, or the Murgich minnow, these are all flies that are suspend after you pause and they don't sink. And a lot of times that is the go-to fly. So if you were fishing for largemouth other than fishing up on the surface with poppers, or intermediate line, don't be afraid to fish a sinking leader with a floating fly or a hollow fly that gets it down below the surface, but it still allows that action of the fly to be appealing to the fish. This is probably one of my go-to really easy to tie hollow flies. It's um, basically a gray olive and you can apply basically some type of doll eyes, you can apply the weight, but this is an unweighted with jungle cock. But chartreuse flash, gray olive, craft fur, very easy fly to tie. I tie it on a shank. I bend spinner wire with a nice uh, hook on the very, very end there. I've caught everything that swims with that using natural bait fish colors or chartreuse white, olive white color patterns. Catch from night walleye fishing to anything that swims on Lake Erie. Um, other than the drum and the catfish, but the targeted game fish will chase that down like crazy. Standard clousers, I tie about six or eight different clouser patterns, bright flashy ones for steelhead like this. And don't be afraid to tie purple or pink clousers for freshwater drum. Extremely effective, orange, pinks, um, and basically that is a great color combination. The chartreuses and whites and whites and olives are gonna be really, really good for walleyes, but some of the really bright colors will be extremely good. Um, when you notice for color selection, one last bullet point is that when we talked about bait fish, think about throwing a fly that looks like a bait fish in a school of bait fish our presentation gets lost in the mysterious cloud of bait fish. But by fishing bright fluorescent colors, your pinks and oranges and your chartreuses, it sticks out of the pack like a black sheep. And you'll be surprised that even if the water's clear that those highlighted colors, when they break out of the schools of bait fish, that sometimes those are more effective than fishing natural bait fish patterns when you're fishing in and around a lot of bait fish. So don't be afraid to fish out of the box colors. Wrapping things up, I mean, we live in a very wonderful, wonderful area and don't be afraid to fish at nighttime. We have even glow in the dark lines we have now, floating lines, um, but it's pretty nice to call Cleveland our home waters, waters for us to explore with the fly rod. But even if you don't catch any fish in the fly rod, it's pretty wonderful to watch the sunset casting a fly rod into our home waters. That concludes my presentation. Really appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks, Jeff. That was, that was awesome. Uh, really appreciate the information. Um, we didn't get any questions into the chat, but I'm guessing there's, there's probably some out there in the, uh, <clears throat> in the world. So feel free to unmute yourself or if you want to just post it in the chat, I'll make sure it gets uh, passed along and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll answer any questions that come across here. Thanks, Bob. In, in the meantime, while, while people think of anything or, or decide if they want to ask anything, Jeff, I'll, I'll ask you a quick question here. Um, as a fairly new fisherman, fairly new fly fisherman, for sure, 
Um, you know, there, there was some stuff that you talked about um, where fishing in the weed beds was really key to getting to the fish, right? Um, you know, this is, I'm sure this is a troublesome uh, <laughs> situation for everybody, right? No one wants to get hung up on the, on the weeds and everything. Any uh, tactics or, or advice you can present to us for, for kind of fishing those situations? Yeah, Bob, um, if you, so before the weeds completely emerge, you know, that's, you, you'll be able to strip your fly over them. Um, also too, is believe it or not, um, if you can visually see the weeds and if you're talking where the weeds are so dense, you can't get in them. Um, and this is a pattern that I have to really, really, really be like, we've, we're probably gonna call the terminology dabbling but in August, when the weeds get so hard, the only place you could fish is at the edges of them, but the fish are in them. I'll actually use a floating line with a 12 foot leader with a really heavy tungsten weighted fly. And I'll fish the pockets and I'll give it two or three, four jigs um, and pull it out. And that was one of the techniques I used on Mosquito Lake um, to catch the walleyes and the really deep and Chautauqua Lake um, to catch those fish in and around there too, because the fish are in the weeds, like you said, but as a fly angler, we want to strip across them. And if the fish aren't active, they won't come up out of it. So we might have to use that word dabbling a little bit more strategic floating line, long leaders and heavy flies. Yeah. Jeff, got a question for you about fishing the drum. Uh, sure. How, um, how spooky are they compared to say carp? You know, I, in my, on my stand up paddle board, um, I've noticed a bunch of drum that seem fishable. I haven't tried it yet out on Lake Erie, but I'm, I can get pretty on top of them with my paddle board. I'm wondering if, you know, you can get a good shot at them or if you can see them, they're going to see you and they're not going to eat. What, what's your experience? You know, Chris, the drum are not as wary as the carp. And what's really cool about a drum is, is that, or any species, is that you need to throw the fly outside of their awareness zone by quite a bit. And then bring the fly into the awareness zone um, very stealthily. If you throw the fly into a drum's awareness zone where they see it hit and fall, you more than likely won't spook it, but he probably won't eat. Now, a catfish will come over and annihilate it, but the drum, um, and I fish a lot of super sight fish and shallow water drum off my paddle board, and I have to lead them quite a bit um, and get their attention and then make that proper angle of attack so they see it, if you know what I mean. Just like swinging a fly in the river. So do you, do you end up using stealthier lines um, in order so they don't see the, you know, the sink? Or I guess I'm curious, you can cast away and strip it into them. Is that basically it? Well, so when you position the paddle board, you make sure that if the fish are basically, because they have a bladder, so they actually will suspend right. a little bit and they don't move around a lot. So if you position the paddle board, imagine the scenario, the, the analogy of upstream of them. So when you throw at them, you're not throwing the line over their back or they see the line. So it's a, it's a 99.9% .9 of my, my client's success is me being able to control the boat to put them in the right angle of attack because fishing is a is nothing more than a game of angles and when you figure out the angle of attack that works and that's where you'll find out that you're going to be the angle of attack is going to be where they see the fly and the leader and not the fly line if that makes sense yep thanks hi this is tammy um Thanks for your presentation. We get to the Cleveland area to visit family fairly uh, frequently from Pennsylvania. 
and we would like to bring our kayaks. Where would you recommend in the Cleveland area are the best places to kayak fish from? Great. Um, so Tammy, the seeing that you have your own kayaks and you don't have to rent them, it's not a logistics of, you know, you have to rush up because everything's on the hour to hour. Um, so if you're looking for the best fishing, I would say if you could launch in and around the Cuyahoga River has a kayaking launch up the river, but you can also launch at Edgewater Park um, that's owned by Cleveland Metro Parks. Um, and then within, I'm not, I mean, seriously, as soon as you launch, you can start fishing in and around the marina, in and around the breakwall complex, which is protected by the offshore breakwall. Um, and seeing that the Edgewater launching facility is at the far west end of the breakwall complex. If you were to just hug the shoreline and paddle along and cast your fly rod in and around the rocks and the little, um, you'll see a bunch of coves and things and you'll see some, a lot of um, weeds that have grown into like uh, evasive trees that provide shade and just start there and work your way all the way down to East 72nd um, in and around this, you know, the shallows and the marinas, you, that's going to be your go-to spot. Um, you will have to be careful, you know, of course, when you're a kayaker with some boat wakes once in a while on a weekend, because it gets pretty crazy. But if you're fishing in the mornings and the evenings, it's usually not as bad as the mid mid afternoons. Thank you. Yep. Um, another thing, Tammy, too, is if you, are adventurous, a really cool fish is if you launch, um, you can launch in, in Rocky River Reservation. There's actually a kayak launch on Rocky River, the Metro Parks, and you can not so much fish in the river, you can um, fish your way out the river, but you can fish either east or west out of the mouth of Rocky River, which has really good shoreline fishing there but not as good. That's gonna be more midsummer white bass opportunities out of Rocky. But another cool one is um, in around the Black River, uh, in and around the, the mouth of the Black River, which is Lorena Har Harbor, there is a really great fish and paddle experience by just paddling up the Black River all the way up to French Creek. Um, fishing along the shoreline, fishing around the marinas, you don't have to worry about boat traffic because it's no wake. Um, so that's a really cool fish, really scenic too to go all the way up to French Creek. It's going to take you all day to do that fish. Perfect. Thanks. Sure. Hey, hey, Jeff, you really didn't say too much about, you know, what size tippet or anything to use for the different things. Uh, maybe do a quick go over on that. Sure, JD. Um, basic rule of thumb is if you're using a floating line, um, you want to at least have the leader and the junction of the tippet or just a leader, the length of your rod to start out with, with the floating line. But as Jerry said, there, you know, and I said that there are times that you might want to lengthen up. So with a floating line, sometimes I'm using as long as a 12 foot leader with a sinking fly to allow the fly to be able to sink at greater depths. And as far as the, as far as the brake strength, I haven't found it necessary to outsmart fish. So I usually start in around the zero X, you know, 12, 13 pound. Um, there are times I even go heavier, but if you st stay right in around zero X, that'll keep you from breaking off some larger fish, maybe save a few flies in the break walls. And occasionally, if you're fishing for carp, you will probably have to line down a little bit and tip it down a little bit on your leader and your, and your tippet size. But in general, I try to stay in around that zero X to start with just because they're pretty active fish at that point. Um, and then if you're picking out a sinking leader, um, the sinking leaders is in replace of your standard nylon leaders. And basically you attach that to the front of your weight forward line. But when you're using a sinking leader, I try to use a leader um, after the sinking part, the leader or tippet part is around anywhere from three to four feet. Cause you sort of want that to be following that sinking part of the fly line. But um, 
general rule of thumb for me is if I have a floating or neutral buoyant unweighted fly, I keep it shorter. And if I have a weighted fly, I might go a little bit longer to allow that to impair action jigging, if that makes sense, Jerry. Yep. Okay. And do you, uh, you know, fluorocarbon, do you think it matters, uh, you know, for most of that fishing? You know, um, I would love to say it doesn't matter, but I have had some occasions, like Chris was saying, that um, I've had better success even with the fluorocarbon leader. Um, so there, my thought process on that is, is that I generally use fluorocarbon just because it can't hurt. Um, and it does have a little properties that allows it to sink a little better and shock resistant and a little more abrasion resistance with today's you know, technologies. Um, so I would say that I'm pretty blessed that I get to you know, work with us scientific anglers and be able to get that at a reasonable price. But day in and day out, I would say that if you had just start standard nylon, you'd be okay to give that a shot though. Okay. All right. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you helping us out tonight and sharing that knowledge and, and Jerry for helping to get this going and Bob for your uh, IT help there halfway through. Thank I've got you. Figured it out. So um, Jeff, if anyone else has other questions, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Oh uh, yeah, Kendrick, it would be just my name at jeffliske at gmail.com or you can go to the website at greatlakesflyfishing.com. Um, and then feel free to have the memberships. If you guys follow up with the newsletter, Jerry, you can follow up. And if there's any specific questions or whatever, uh, between, between you and myself, we can field this question. It'd be nice to get the fly fishing community taking advantage of this fishery. Yeah, no, no doubt. I agree. And I think it's, um, it's something so unique to our region and we just haven't really, um, exported it you know to the larger angling community a lot of people i think come in for steelhead and walleye and and that certainly seems to be big but from my perspective anyway even locally we haven't really cracked this open yet so i think it's awesome you're trying to figure it out on the fly yeah great all right well if you guys have any questions please reach out to jeff um and if you have anything about the club, let myself or Jerry know. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys on the water here uh, once it gets a little warmer and the pandemic slows down a bit. Thanks, Kendrick, for the invite. Jerry and Bob, thank you. Don't forget about next week. Oh, yeah. Next week we've got our, uh, our first fly tying special. We've got... Uh, Ara Hamamjian from the uh, from the Trout Club doing a presentation on the Prince Nymph. Uh, he's going to show us the uh, the original pattern and then uh, some variations on it with a, a focus in on you know what to kind of look for in your flies as you as you think about how to change them up and and, and modify them and, and make variants in it. So should be very fun, very educational. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, get even more of the IT stuff, uh, figured out before then we're, <laughs> it's a learning process on our end. So thanks for bearing with us. Yep. And also that for the link for uh, our program, will be going up on, uh, on the Instagram page here, uh, probably within the next couple of days. Nice, Jerry. All right. Excellent. Again, thanks everybody. Jeff, thank you. Talk thanks, to everybody guys. soon. Okay. Right, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Thank Good you night. very, very much for the invite, guys. All right, Joe.